Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we are going to talk about destruction and disaster. We have all been, including you, our listeners, deeply affected by the fires in Australia. And although there are other kinds of uh, natural events that feel apocalyptic, uh, this seems to be in a scale that has grabbed the world's attention with loss of life and the loss of, I read, one billion animals. So although this is a very sobering topic, we are going to circumambulate it in our usual fashion and see what kind of meaning from a psychic and perhaps spiritual viewpoint it may hold for us. When you had brought up the idea that it's the scale of the fire Mm -hmm. and and something this enormous, and when I think about even in, in the human psyche, when the scale of a continental fire wakes up in the soul, it must be met with something equally powerful from the collective, that something almost godlike needs to rally in the human spirit to meet the power of what's happening destructively. You know, I'm thinking, Joseph, uh, following up on what you said, that there's a way that It's almost like the divine, or perhaps we could think of it as the dark side of the self often manifests through disaster or or destruction. Yes. And on first blush, you know, everything in us wants to run away. Everything wants to pull inside to shield ourselves. We feel like we're being victimized. You know, it's like Job, you know, when the travesties start to hit him. You know, he's just kind of lamenting his fate. But analytically, as we have the courage and some clarity to sit in the disaster, can we find the hand of something much greater than ourselves at work? Yeah, I mean, one of our colleagues, Greg Mogensen, has written a book called God is a Trauma. And wow, that is a, that's a really powerful statement right there. And it always seems um, a, a little counterintuitive, but Jung did emphasize that God or his God image, which he called the self, uh, has a dark side as well as a sort of light or bright side. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that worldwide, these fires in Australia have constellated that in the collective psyche even if it hasn't been named as such. Yeah, you know, Jung has that quote, which I I wish I could grab in its, you know, exact wording, but something like, I call God that which, you know, thwarts my desire and tramples me underfoot and, and that sort of thing. It's, you know, and there is a way that a disaster such as the Australian fires really does put us in direct contact with something much larger than ego. Yes, that whatever we think about ourselves being powerful and competent and having buckets of money in the face of the magnitude of something like the fires, one only has to stand in a kind of horrified awefulness. Mm -hmm. And that word awful actually, in less modern times, actually meant to be full of awe. And that kind of awe was the kind of shaking dread that we feel when we come up against something that is so much more powerful than us that we almost don't know how to respond to it. Yeah, and so that's this idea of kind of dark numinosity. And we know from mythology that these kinds of events that are 
are from God uh, manifested through nature, you know, such as the destruction of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah or the flood, have always been associated uh, with this kind of godlike power. And I'd like to also just um, step back for a second, just to orient the listeners, that I know that uh, in the United States, when we use the word God, it kind of evokes a very specific kind of image, perhaps even something you know, like Jesus tending sheep or lambs and being really sweet, and that God is good, and God is light. But I just want to say that for Jung and for Jungians, the idea of God spans the kind of ancient, profound, roaring images of God all the way up to the meek and mild, modernized versions of God. And that when we evoke the word God, we're talking about all the gods or all the representations of gods since antiquity. And when one holds that as a concept, there's so much evidence that the archetype has these terrifying aspects as well as life-giving and life-creating. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that for people to make sense of how we're using the word. And I would extend that, and I really appreciate your uh, saying that, Joseph, to nature and natural phenomena. Of We have uh, for thousands and thousands of years lived in a natural context where rivers flooded and forest fires burned and we depended on the rains to come at the right time and for our crops to grow and all kinds of things. We were right there in the matrix of natural power and forces, which could be benign and they could be terribly destructive. So the term God is, uh, as you're kind of pointing out and I'm amplifying, is very much broader than any one specific doctrinal or religious image. And writing on that, Deb, um, we're going to get a little heady for a moment, but it goes to the God-making function in human beings because human beings are symbol-generating miracles that even in ancient humanity, you're encountering a tornado or hurricanes or, mm -hmm. or massive fires. And that as people take that in as a lived reality, and then it becomes a psychological reality, something in the human spirit shapes it into a symbol so that it can be relatable to, because in its full outer magnitude, it, it's nothing but overwhelming. So as human beings, we take it in, and then it begins to be shaped into a symbol, and those early symbols were most likely the images, became the images of the ancient gods based on natural interaction. So I'm, I'm aware that we started off talking about disasters and, in, and specifically the Australian fires. And here we are, we've gotten into this really, um, this place where we're talking about sort of the, the dis, I don't know, this destructive face of God, perhaps. Um, so I'm just kind of tracking our process that it, it seems like we're, we're having an easier time staying here. But I have something else to add here <laughs> before we perhaps land back on the ground. Because when I think about this, um, there's somewhere in, um, in uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces, there's this great passage that I couldn't find. But, but basically, a, a lot of myths seen from the God's perspective, these great destructive acts seem just kind of normal and every day. But from a human perspective, they're a terrible tragedy. And I think it's that dual perspective that we're touching into when we, we talk about the dark face of God, as it were. And one example of that would be the Bhagavad Gita. So our we've mentioned this on the podcast before, uh, I'm going to try to summarize. I hope I don't butcher it. But Arjuna's on the battlefield. He's waiting to rage this, wage this great battle. And he recognizes some of his extended family members in the opposite uh, army and says, I can't do it. And then his charioteer uh, reveals himself to be none other than Vishnu and grants Arjuna this uh, vision of just 
terrible destruction. And he sees uh, these tusked and terrible mouths, frightful to behold. And uh, it says, as the torrents of many rivers rush toward the ocean, so do the heroes of the mortal world rush into thy fiercely flaming mouths. And people are just being destroyed and crushed by the thousands. And he says, I, I don't understand. I don't understand this, you know, your purpose. And Vishnu says, I am mighty world-destroying time, now engaged here in slaying these men. Even without you, all these warriors standing arrayed in the opposing armies shall not live. Therefore, stand up and win glory. And so what has happened, uh, as Campbell tells us, is that Arjuna has been blessed with a vision transcending the scope of normal human destiny and amounting to a glimpse of the essential nature of the cosmos, not his personal fate, but the fate of mankind, of life as a whole. And I think that's something of the flavor of that which we encounter in the face of a huge disaster or destruction like the Australian fires. Well, you know, my thought is about, I think part of why this is so really awful, as Joseph said, is that I think we are all wondering about where the human participation in this destructive fire, where have we as human beings gone astray, much as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were punished? much as people were punished by the flood, except for Noah and his family, or in the story of of Zeus and Hermes, uh, the people in the town who did not show them hospitality were destroyed. And I think we're all wondering a bit about what are we, humanity, doing to set this destructive fireball rolling it's almost, you know, sort of looked at it that way. Is this punishment, purification? It, we're kind of moving now out of this um, rarefied archetypal lens, and we're holding the tension of the opposites and really talking about the lived sense experience of these things. And and really that that those two things do have to meet each other in order for the human psyche to survive these the magnitude of these losses. What I wanted to say, Lisa, about your story, the myth of the Bhagavad Gita, is I would say that we do not encounter the myth in these traumatic wars, is that the psyche generates the myth. So the experience of the wars does not annihilate the human spirit, that we need these images, we need themes, we need structures of thinking and meaning, so that doesn't just ruin. Yeah. And in a sense, we don't have an answer to this, but I'm imagining that the people in Australia are right in this process and something in their psyches is undoubtedly waiting for a, for a myth, an image, a series of images to rise up out of the human spirit to help them stand in the fire. Mm-hmm. To make meaning of it somehow. Deb, I think your point is a really good one. And and as you said, Joseph, it's kind of bringing us back down into the practical is, you know, there's no question that this is this is not just a natural disaster, sort of a, a quote unquote act of God, right? That there's real human complicity here probably in more ways than one. There's there's certainly, uh, you know, things have been hotter and drier in Australia because of climate change. And also, I I was uh, reaching around and uh, and found, you know, that traditional ways of managing the bush that the Aboriginal people uh, participated in involved these, you know, what we think of in the states as sort of controlled burns. Um, apparently, according to the BBC, that the indigenous people of, of Australia would kind of keep these cool burning fires happening almost continuously that would burn up fuel like kindling uh, 
and make it impossible for a huge fire like this to take place. And, you know, I know that this is a lesson that the, you know, was learned in the natural and the national parks out West in the United States as well, that there was a long time where they would put out any fires and, and then there, there were just these huge, very destructive fires. And they realized that the small fires uh, were necessary. The small frequent flyers, oh, excuse me, frequent fires were very necessary to, to correctly managing the landscape. And so what this makes me think psychologically, Deb, I think as to your point is there's something about being in right relationship with the natural world. And we can think about that also as the need for the ego to be in right relationship with the unconscious. So that's such an enormous topic. So relative to, you know, what people are experiencing, and I also want to add the earthquakes in Puerto Rico and now a volcano in New Zealand and a volcano in um, the Philippines. I mean, wow, right? Everywhere. So in this model of standing with nature, standing with the unconscious, what kind, where does one go with that realization? You know, to extend my metaphor a little bit, I think this idea about being willing to tolerate either sort of the natural fires that occur that would have occurred before, for example, humans were managing the landscape, or in the case of the indigenous people in Australia, kind of creating these cool burns kind of continuously, there's there's the sense of having to cede some control, not to be in perfect control all the time. That would be part of it. Uh, and I think you know, clearly the ego has to be able to tolerate the fact that it's not in perfect control of the unconscious. And also it's really embracing the process of um, destruction and renewal or death and rebirth. The distinction that I would make that gives these uh, fires in Australia, which we're using because it's very real, but it certainly is not the only example of disaster in which mankind feels complicit, as distinguished from the volcanoes, for example, uh, which are natural forces that erupt that I think we don't feel uh, any sense of complicity in. They, they're really autonomous expressions of, of nature or uh whatever meaning one might want to assign. Or, or Vulcan. Or Vulcan. But I think that... Hephaestus. <laughs> I think that unlike the controlled burns that the Aboriginal people could understand in Australia, I think our fear is that we have not been good stewards in a broad way for all of the complexity and the variables that cause... Uh, climate change, hotter, drier weather, not just in Australia, but here in the States and other places. And that, that that's the issue here. And you asked at some point, you know, what do we, you know, how do we make meaning of it? And we'll see what arises from this and other disasters. But I'm thinking about the call to the great and amazing significance of human consciousness. And Jung called it the cosmic significance of human consciousness. And he said, as far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. And so I'm thinking, first of all, it is a call to greater consciousness. We belong to something greater than ourselves. And we are being called into a, a very different kind of awareness that we depend on Mother Earth. And we cannot uh, simply burn fossil fuels or you know do all uh, other kinds of things and have our uh, egoistic way with the planet. So this goes to 
much of Jung's work when he talks about the dissolution of an old attitude that makes way for a new attitude. And the new attitude, unlike just a random idea, an attitude is something that's woven into the foundation of someone's psyche, which sustains and kind of thrums as a background. So th there is an opportunity in, in thinking about this as a, a tragedy that Manus co-participated in, mm -hmm. that there's a demand because of the extent of the horror to find a new, a new attitude that might be an inoculation against this happening over and over again. I think one of the key features from looking at these images and it is the annihilation of so many, many animals. And that is certainly not to denigrate human life or property, but there is something about animals, koalas, kangaroos, and so many other creatures uh. as images of our innocent vulnerable young selves, that this wanton destruction strikes a, a new chord in our hearts, even though there's been so much publicity, for example, about the Amazon fires. There, this massive sudden destruction of natural life has made the fires in Australia touch us uh, with a, a depth of sorrow. And even to have a ring in oneself that you are or I am responsible for the horrific death of an innocent being, mm -hmm. that, that can split something open so that a different attitude might emerge from that. So while it is, of course, we want to not look at those heartbreaking images, and yet something in us is cold to look at them. That's why they're, you know... You, they're sprouting all over the internet, all over social media, because in order to be affected by it, one has to integrate those images so that we can be broken open to something that's different. You know, uh, there's a, an interesting natural phenomenon that seems relevant to this conversation that we're having about uh, something being broken open uh, that can give birth to a new attitude. These certain plants, among which includes the eucalyptus, actually, that have the serotonous cones. These cones are sealed with a kind of, you know, resin, and they will only open to release the seeds after the heat of a fire has melted the resin. So to me, this is really profound because it says, first of all, that fire, this destructive process is natural and necessary for the birth of the new attitude. Now, of course, uh, fires of the magnitude that we're seeing in Australia are not natural and necessary for this. But just in general, it seems like a powerful metaphor. I think we're moving into circumambulating uh, the archetype of fire and uh, that it can be, as it is in Australia, uh, horrendously uh, destructive and disastrous. Another kind of fire can make um, the eucalyptus pods, and I think there are some pine tree pods that are uh, activated in the same way. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm thinking about, we talk about uh, fire in the belly as, a, as energy for life. You know, you have to have Z fire and Z belly. We talk about passions as being hot. Anger is hot. There are a lot of associations to the archetype of, of fire for our own emotional bandwidth and, and range of emotional feeling. What that evokes for me, Deb, is thinking about how the physical fire in Australia is also calling forth an internal fire mm. in many Australias. Australians, the fire of the heart is also stoked. And people are finding themselves engaging the crisis in ways that may even surprise them. As we're looking at media, you know, we're seeing sometimes rather um, ordinary people who suddenly, you know, are taking in baby kangaroos and they're putting straw around their living room and, and feeling absolutely compelled to participate in nurturing these creatures or 
people who might have seen a wounded koala on the side of the road eight years ago and kind of left it to nature now are kind of stopping their cars. And people who may not know whether it's even safe to pick up a koala are now just like picking them up and holding them like babies and calling people up saying, what should I do with this baby at the side of the road? Hikers, cyclists are all of a sudden stopping when they see an animal, they're opening up their water bottles and the animals are coming up to them and drinking from their water bottles. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I think it just shows how desperate the animals are, you know. Well, but in an archetypal field, it's, it's yes, we can, we can literalize it all that way. Mm-hmm. But there's also an archetypal field that in the corona of the fire of the heart, sometimes the natural laws of order are suspended. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a great truth to that. Mm-hmm. I think we might want to call this love. In its truest, fullest sense, yes. Yes, of that tenderness and creaturely feeling, care, and a sense of community. Why don't we call that love? And if we think of love as the the true capacity to connect, not abstractly, but to actually feel connected to living creatures, connected to humanity, connected to the land, and that when the heart is cool or cold, we often don't feel connected. And then we make these kind of isolated, autonomous choices about what we're going to consume and this and that, and not really feel that we're being affected. So, you know, I'm thinking about uh, our hearts breaking open and the pods that you mentioned, Lisa, and maybe this can break our hearts open, this fire and fires elsewhere in the world. And we certainly see this in our consulting room from time to time, that someone comes in having suffered a great, great tragedy, and it is that which breaks them open often to new life. I mean, I, I want to say all the time, you know, I don't want to sort of um, rush to the happy ending here, but often out of great suffering, something new is born. And that the amount of the heat that somebody requires to break open is in rather sometimes rather perfect balance to the amount of frozenness, the amount of locked mm-hmm. upness that's in them. And although looking at it with external eyes, it, it just seems horrifying, but looking at these kinds of events with inner eyes that we can sense these channels of connection between events that are astounding. I'm thinking of an experience that I had many, many years ago. I was the trauma social worker in a level four hospital, level four trauma center. And uh, so I was seeing all of the clients that were admitted initially and some of the clients who were there for a protracted time. And I happened to develop a rather a lengthy relationship, more than most as a hospital social worker with a young man who, because of his complications, had to stay in the hospital for, you know, a little over a month. And as, you know, things began to open up and I heard his story and I watched him and engaged him over those just a few weeks, what kind of surfaced is he had been living, you know, a very um, dangerous, kind of violent life in the underculture and he was very comfortable to that he he was kind of in the jungle part of the human psyche and he was rather cavalier as his cohorts were about carrying pistols so he was at one of the clubs and after it lets out he was out in the parking lot and he thought some fellow was being a little too interested in his girlfriend so he pulled out an, his unloaded gun thinking that that was going to be it's going to frighten people and this fellow and the guy you know pulled out a gun and just shot him in the belly and shattered his spine so he comes into the hospital and this is the condition and and so because of the skill of the surgical team they're able to kind of construct his system enough that he's going to survive interestingly enough he's in the hospital for months because when they had to open up the entire front of his abdomen, that the wound would not close. And so they had to leave it open 
putting uh, batting in it, which ha- had to be uh, removed occasionally, and trust, which happened, that the wound would heal from the inside to the surface. And what I experienced as I got to know him, and he reflected upon this somewhat psychopathic lifestyle and character structure that he had had, he began to regress into a very, very vulnerable, young, soulful place. You know, he'd call me up, page me on the phone. He's like, Joe, Joe, I need you to come to my room, which for a tough guy like that was, you know, very vulnerable. And I, you know, I'd come in and uh, he'd say, you know, so I was talking to somebody and then, and then all of a sudden, as I'm telling him what happened to me, my whole body begins to shake on the bed. And then as he's talking to me, you know, I say, that's actually a feeling. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. an emotion. And he, he's astounded. I mean, even though he's in this terrible circumstance, yeah. you know, it's as if a sacred mystery had actually begun to open up. And so the arc was that his, in my terms, his heart had become active and gr- was growing in a way that didn't seem to be at the center of his personality previously. And all of a sudden, a kind of feeling-based morality began to emerge as he then began to assess his life decisions and his future choices in the midst of all of this feeling towards the end of his stay. He called me up because he wanted to meet me to meet uh, his infant who he had never seen. He had wow. called up uh, one of his girlfriends who'd had a child with him, and he didn't feel connected to the pregnancy. I don't think she wanted him around, frankly, the way he was back then. But all of a sudden, he had this probably three year old child on his bed, you know, and he's talking to her in this tremendous, gentle, soft way. And then after they left and he called me in to talk with him, he said, I just didn't think any of that mattered. (gasps) Wow. And now it does. Yeah. So in the destruction of his body, a terrible, terrible trauma. Yeah. Something then had the space to emerge. Yeah. And his his wound that wouldn't close, I mean, I'm thinking back to these lodgepole pine cones. (laughs) That you know, they, they it takes a lot for them to open. It takes this kind of destructive force, but but then something opened up. And what I'm aware of in that really wonderful and touching story is how important it is that we stay in touch with our feelings, and that that is how we open is we simply feel uh, related to people far away from us. We feel related to the animals. We feel sorrow. We care. And we're aware that our hearts are breaking. And it takes time for the feelings in the midst of a trauma to even return, by the way, secondary to this fellow's transformation. I imagine there are many people who are brushing up against the fires and the earthquakes in Puerto Rico, and their feelings are rather numb, that as a survival process, the feelings can go very, very underground, and people move in a kind of relaxed, trance-like way, which is the nervous system's way of protecting itself for a while. As the feelings return, particularly if we're up against, as Lisa said, an apocalyptic dimension of tragedy and disaster, one of the things that I was thinking about when you were bringing up the uh, Bhagavad Gita is in absence of a new myth, it is perfectly reasonable for people to take refuge in an old myth. And so when I was thinking about the story of of, uh, Arjuna on the battlefield, He's horrified. He's actually frozen. He's numb in the face of going to war with his relatives, actually. The other Mm -hmm. half of his family is on the other side. And Vishnu, the avatar of Vishnu, has to provide him with a myth 
in which he can take refuge. And it's in that refuge that then he can mobilize. And so we see that happening. Actually, you know, I sometimes it sounds ridiculous when our evangelical friends, you know, are in the midst looking at this and they're all talking about the apocalypse. And this means that Jesus is going to be coming. We're all going to be brought into heaven. And then the new Jerusalem is going to land. And, and, you know, when we're looking at trying to respond to the concrete disaster, I mean, some of us are kind of rolling our inner eyes back, groaning, but what they're doing is they're taking refuge in a myth so they actually don't freeze up. So if it's the myth of the second coming that's in their hands and they can contain horror, cultural horror that's happening, it allows them to make some kind of forward movement. Well, and also the those myths, whether it's the second coming or, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, they're expressing an archetypal truth. They're not just some kind of defense. The archetypal truth is that something new does grow from destruction. And there can be uh, some kind of renewal in the midst of the horror. I'm not thinking of taking refuge in a myth as a defense. Okay. I think that's I think the human psyche is designed to do that. Mm-hmm. I think when we are escaping into a myth psychotically and then we become unable to adapt to outer conditions, then we're in a a really horrifying kind of defense. Mm-hmm. But when we are actually just holding the myth and it allows a shape of meaning, which again is inherited, it wasn't generated in that moment, people can still walk and talk, and they can make decisions without being frozen on the battlefield like Arjuna. And I just wanted to give one example of that, which I think is interesting. So sometimes people will put the myth outside them. You know, the god of fire has descended into the forest. It's outside me. You know, Jesus has instigated the second coming, and that's outside of me. Where it gets a little in a difficult place, Lisa, that you were leaning into, is when the individual inserts themselves into the myth and they identify with a character. And I'm thinking about a a famous moment uh, when Oppenheimer uh, was observing how this nuclear technology was being harnessed to atom bombs. In that moment, he went to the Bhagavad Gita and he said, now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. Mm, he mm, did mm-hmm. what Arjuna did because the overwhelming reality of what he had participated in was intolerable, but he still had to remain active in the world. So he took a reasonable refuge in the same story that Arjuna did. I'm going back. To, I like this um, thread here of how and what kinds of mythologies uh, can guide us, can contain us, can provide meaning. And I think that a new myth and a new mythology uh, may also be surfacing, just little inklings of it. And I think that it has something to do with uh, connection, community, and caring. I think it was there in the film Avatar. It's been there in some of the new films that have been very popular that, you know, Disney, great popularizing force, has put out of Mujan and the film Frozen. Um, It's been in some of the heroines like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And we may think of some of this stuff as just sort of, you know, popular fiction, cartoon characters, but it's really more than that. And I think that these fires in Australia have catalyzed feelingfulness all around the world. Well, when we talk about the the popularity of the new Disney movies, we're also talking about fairy tales, which also yes, we are experience and have for thousands of years and communicate collective wisdom about one thing or another. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a new story, I actually don't know whether Frozen was based on an old fairy tale 
but, but even if amazingly they've actually created a new fairy tale about female empowerment and the, which I think many people view it as, as what does a woman have to go through to individuate and not be suppressed or oppressed because she's considered dangerous because she's powerful. Well, I think it's a new myth around what is a hero. A hero. Uh, that instead of getting on your horse and, uh, you know, pulling out your sword and sort of vanquishing, what if you connect? What if you befriend? What if you have empathy? There, that there's a new kind of heroic story that has to do with what we classically call the feminine. Now, in these films and TV series and so on, it's imaged as a, a young woman or a girl. But we all have those kinds of qualities. Well, I I hope I hope you're right. I, I do some, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some some days I I feel a little darker. You know about what what all this destruction means, and I certainly try not to you know give in to that because I don't know that that's going to do any good. But I I am aware that you know Jung had this uh, vision. Of it was an apocalyptic and terrible destruction, rivers of blood in Europe, and and this was shortly before World War One, and he realized when war broke out that it had been you know premonitory. Um, toward the end of his life, he had a disturbing vision of the last fifty years of mankind, which apparently was never published and only exist in notes, and he. He told Marie Louise von Franz of another vision, apparently, where he saw enormous stretches of the planet devastated. Mm. That's disturbing, isn't it? Yes, and you're calling us, I think, very rightly to sit with what is. Yes. And the destruction of. Um, in Australia, volcanoes, Puerto Rico, the Amazon, the list is extensive. We need to be here with that now. Yeah. And not rush into, um, as you said once before, sort of a happy ending. We're called to be able to stand it and to let yes. our hearts break. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we have the, what we're called to do is to bear it. Yes. Which is a lot. It is a lot. And I would honestly suggest uh, maybe we could bear comforting our neighbors they, they lost their home or comforting each other in a, in a, in a moment together. But I, st I really do say that I do not believe it is possible for any human being to contain the magnitude, the archetypal magnitude of what's happening. Right. It just can't be possible. Right. And so I would like to make a request of our listeners who live in Australia and perhaps even live in the Philippines. Would you send us any dreams that you're having where you feel that your soul is meeting the fire or the disaster with something mythic? Or surprising, and and give us permission to talk about it, because if there is a mythic response, I think it's most likely to be rising up in the Australian psyche, because it's being called forward, it's being required mm. by that. So I really hope we'll hear from some of you. Yeah, that's a that that's a a wonderful idea, Joseph. So here we are, Joseph, you've just connected. You've reached out and made an invitation to connect uh, with people who are there and who are in the midst of this disaster and destruction. That really feels important to me. I would like to just have a quiet moment here in the podcast. I'd like us to just exhale for a minute and to ask our listeners to also just exhale for a minute. And we're going to take just a, a minute of silence to just respect the magnitude of what we just talked about. <laughs> 
So I think it's in the silence sometimes, which often is the only response we have in the beginning, that we can just help hold the magnitude of something. And with that, perhaps we can transition into the dream. Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. A male dreamer who is 31 years old and an IT specialist sends in this dream. It's a sunny afternoon and I'm walking in a loose crowd with my entire extended family up a hill on a large field of green grass. Forest surrounds us at the far edges. We are on our way to a funeral. The atmosphere is serene. Suddenly, from the corner of my eye, I notice a lumberjack-like man walking past everyone through the crowd, carrying a huge leather mesh bag on his back. I can see the bag consists of three grown grizzly bears. Once the man arrives at the top of the hill, which is quite far ahead of me and my nuclear family, he sets down the massive bag and zips it open. I'm thinking, stop! The three bears scramble out of the bag and wreak havoc on the crowd. It quickly goes dark, and the dream turns into a hide-and-seek sort of horror show. I'm hiding with my father in a small, half-built old wooden cottage by which a river flows, and I see one of the bears swimming, searching. A bit of context uh, the dreamer shares that around this time he had been suspecting that a romantic relationship was coming to a painful end, which later turned out to be true. And he adds about the dream, I didn't feel I would get caught and die at any point. Bears have been chasing me before in dreams, especially as an adolescent. But this time I felt relatively safe, although I had to make sure I kept it that way by actively hiding. I was going through the dreams to pick the dream for the podcast, and I came across this one, and I was like, oh, I love this dream. I don't know what it's about, but I love it. There's just something about these bears (laughs) that's just so great. But, you know, it's funny. I don't, I feel like hearing it, hearing you read it again just now, Joseph, I don't know that I can uh, break it apart. I feel like I almost have to give a sort of holistic view. So I'm just going to go for it. Okay, go for it. The the first thing, of course, that I notice is the, the idea that a funeral is serene. I mean, that, that is an inappropriate feeling to go along with a funeral. So I find that interesting. And then there's this lumberjack of a man who kind of strides up the hill, as I understand it, kind of passes them. I mean, I always have this just impossibly big bag. I mean, grizzly bears are huge. You know, a person couldn't carry one grizzly bear, much much less three. So it's this, uh, you know, almost kind of primordial, sort of primordial kind of nature man or something who has all of this bear energy. So what I'm thinking here is that the lumberjack is a kind of shadow I would be curious about this dreamer and uh, kind of who he is and how he presents and how he relates to himself as a man and what his ideas are about masculinity, because I think there's a lot of real 
primal masculine energy in the unconscious, in the shadow that's being carried by the the lumberjack. And the thing about bears is they're often associated with the feminine. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, I thought the same thing as you, Lisa, um, that who goes to a serene funeral? People are grieving. They're right. upset and there are often all kinds of psychological undercurrents uh, going on amongst extended family uh, members. In my experience, there's unfinished business, there's anger, there, uh, you know, but whatever a funeral is, I, I Serene does not seem it's, it's not a, a good serene. descriptor. And I, I pictured somebody sort of like a Paul Bunyan-like man, you know, somebody big enough to stride over hills. Uh, and these bears, to my mind, don't evoke a maternal image at all because they're grizzly bears. And grizzly bears are aggressive, very aggressive, as we know from that um, the movie about Grizzly Man and so many images of these very aggressive and powerful bears and this sort of lumberjack man. So I'm thinking about images of the masculine that are very heroic and and grandiose. He's, this guy is larger than life. He's the masculine writ large. Right, which would say to me something about uh, the way that maybe that kind of masculinity is undervalued by the consciousness of the dreamer. Yes. That it shows up in such a big way. You know, it's possible the bears, you know, are not associated with the feminine, but, you know, they are a symbol that's associated with the great mother. They're just symbolically bears go with a with a great mother. So if you'll just indulge me for a minute with the idea that <laughs> okay. the bear energy might be connected with the feminine, who has access to that energy but this kind of inner masculine figure. It's like to to gain access to the feminine, he has to contact it through this shadowy masculine energy and there's some support for that in the dream by the fact that um there is no feminine energy in the dream he and his dad are hiding um and then he has this issue in his outer life with a relationship presumably with a woman i mean we don't know for sure but i'm just making that assumption so i think there might be something here about his relationship to the feminine and how that is uh, kind of moderated, perhaps, through this masculine energy that he is cut off from. You know, and, and you're right, this kind of serene funeral, there's some affective stuff missing mm -hmm. that really gets unleashed when the bears get out of the bag. Well, you know, I'm really kind of willing to uh, really take in your point about that the bears are the hidden feminine uh, symbolically. And I'm back to um, this serene atmosphere at the funeral as possibly an image of denial or suppression of affect which then has to be compensated for by this lumberjack, larger than life kind of guy, and three bears um, in his in in the bag on his back. And if you think about it, there's sort of three men who are named or identified in the dream, and three bears. Aha! Uh -huh. I'm really thinking about how the lumberjack feels like a very archetypal man. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the master of bears. <laughs> yeah. He just carries him around in a sack. I want that job. Yeah. And I think, I'm not sure how big bears are, but I'm imagining they're like a thousand pounds a piece. So this guy is really Paul Bunyan. Yeah. Carrying around 3,000 pounds of bears, perhaps, <laughs> uh, and can control them. So it's an interesting that the lumberjack seems like a force that can manage the bears and is deciding to release them at the funeral. Yeah, that's a great point. Where they wreak havoc. Yes, and and that could be in service to something, at least in his inner world. Yeah. That as you said, it's so disturbing because everyone's so serene, so orderly, perhaps even a little dissociated, and something in the psyche 
feels that the primal part of this, the horror of the death, mm-hmm. perhaps the the in overwhelming feeling about death has been stuffed into a bag and something in the psyche is just not going to have it. Yeah. And it would appear in the uh, context of what he supplies for information about the ending of a romantic relationship, that it might be a funeral for the death of this relationship that was in the air. He knew it intuitively, even though it didn't happen until uh, afterward. And it makes me think that a lot of guys, at least a lot of modern guys who are gentle and they've been cultivated to be a bit soft, you know, might end a relationship in a very diplomatic, it's okay, you know, no no hard feelings. But yet in the psyche, you know, there's a basket, a bag mm-hmm. of bears that want to just roar and like tear stuff and throw it against the wall and break all the furniture. Yes. You know, and that's not really allowed to... Perhaps maybe it shouldn't be allowed out into the outer world, but sometimes it's not even allowed to be acknowledged in the inner world. And it's a grisly situation. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is. Uh, is. And I I like that, that the primordial affect is let loose on his, you know, inner extended family of all aspects of his psyche. And then it quickly goes down dark and yeah. here comes the 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 really awful part of of his of, of his feeling function and it turns into a hide and seek horror show where he has to hide and this is common in a lot of nightmares a monster is chasing you and we mm-hmm. all know that if you can manage it and you realize it's happening run after the monster and meet it halfway Mm-hmm. That that's almost always the solution psychologically. But but he's hiding with his dad, which I I mean, if I had to guess about the di- the kind of family dynamics of the streamer, I would I would guess that this is a family that avoids affect and avoids confrontation, and that's why the whole family's there for the serene funeral. And then <laughs> when the feelings show up, you know, they're not really dangerous bears. He says, "I don't, you know, I think I'm not going to die," you know. But, but it's like, we have to hide. We have to go hide. So there's a kind of avoidance. There's a sort of avoidance that yeah. I see, maybe. And they just wreak havoc. They could be bears that are just drinking too much. Or they're just <laughs> hanging around at the buffet table, stuffing their faces. You're just wreaking <laughs> havoc, you know, at the funeral. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good point. When I think about what it means to wreak havoc... Uh, no one dies and no one is injured, but you know all the tables are upset and the flower beds are trampled on. You make a big mess. Yeah, I mean, he does say that he has to continue hiding to avoid being killed, right? I think that's somewhere in the context. So, so it's not that they're not dangerous, but 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 they're not quite. There isn't a sense that this is a highly lethal situation. But but the the inveterate response seems to be let's hide. I wonder if he's a little avoidant of conflict and feeling. And now I'm just spinning a story. But I wonder if that has to do with the end of the relationship. I'd also like to um, bring up the etymology of the word havoc because that's an interesting idea behind it. So it um, was an old military term, and uh, to cry havoc was literally that you would be on the battlefield and you'd be with the army and you'd cry out the word havoc. And that was a signal for the art or uh, excuse me, the army to plunder the, the uh, kingdom that had been subdued. Ah. Mm. So, and and I got to tell you that that's a real shadow element of, of death and funerals. You know, there is this spirit of plundering and who's going to get what and where's the will and where are the resources going to, that that is, you know, impolitely now racing through the funeral site. I'm going back to, you know, sort of the context of, and that bears have chased him before in dreams. Yeah, and for for my money, I'm glad you brought that up, Deb, because I I, th- I think that that makes me wonder again about this sort of do bears uh, contain feminine energy? The ending of this dream seems really pretty benign. Of I, the image of a river is flowing, and I see the one of the bears swimming, searching. Now, what I thought about was 
searching for a fish because grizzly bears fish. Yeah, I think the bear is searching for him, though. That's the way I read it. And that he has to actively hide. And, you know, it's like you peek out. It's like the movie. You peek out and you see your your pursuer is out there still looking for you. So I think there is an, it, there is <laughs> some menace at the end of the dream. I, I would. I want. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. You know, is it a happy ending, so to speak? <laughs> the bear just wants some fish, or What's is it menacing? You know, it may be kind of like that old short story about the lady or the tiger, right. and it, it ends without you don't know which. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that that's relevant though, because sort of Joseph, what you were saying, if he could, I mean, the bears are the bears are probably doing something that needs to be done right? By stirring it up. And if you were to turn and meet the bear, you know, he might not be such a negative figure. But I want to say one more thing about that. We know the ego attitude toward these bears, because when the man is opening up the bag, the ego saying, stop. stop. Right. You know, don't let the cat out of the yeah. bag. Right. Bear yes. Bag. <laughs> well, the you- thing I just want to say is the, um, that this has been a recurring dream. And my, my thought often is that when I'm having recurring dreams, it's because there is a message that the unconscious is determined for me to get, and yes. I'm not getting the message. So it sends the same telegram over and over again. Yeah, definitely. So I have had a, a really disturbing dream resolve by just relaxing in a meditative way, go back into the dream, and as you find the bears, to go up to, to them and just ask them, what are you here to teach me? And then to just see how they respond. And in dreams, bears can talk. Absolutely. And some days you get the bear, and some days the bear gets you. Bear gets you. And either way, it's a way of trying to resolve this thing that's haunting you, which almost always is an attitude or a feeling that the ego just does not want to admit or own. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.